It is time now for Morning Rounds. Joining us are CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News Contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up this week, a major announcement of a possible new weapon in the fight against Alzheimer's. John? Benita, for the first time, researchers have developed a simple blood test that may be able to predict whether someone will get the disease or not. Okay, 15 here. 84-year-old Cappy Friedman watched her mother, two sisters, and a brother all develop Alzheimer's. She wonders if she's next. I'm very, very concerned. I've had to watch, you know, three siblings die from this dreadful disease. Friedman and her boyfriend, 82-year-old Bob Bressler, enrolled in a study looking to see if a simple blood test could help predict her future. The study followed 525 people aged 70 and older. After three years, 53 patients were diagnosed with either Alzheimer's or early dementia. When analyzing the blood of those 53 patients, researchers found a group of 10 lipids, or fats, that were at lower levels than in healthy patients. Dr. Howard Fedoroff of Georgetown University is the lead author. We had individuals who also were enrolled who were cognitively normal, and we wanted to know whether the blood test, the 10 lipid panel, would predict their cognitive impairment. It did. Researchers tested the stored blood of 10 people who were initially normal but developed dementia over three years. Nine of the 10 tested positive. If this is validated, what are the implications of the work? We have a basis on finding very uh, uh, much at-risk individuals, which has never existed before. Bob Bressler and the other participants were not told the results, a condition of taking part in the study. If a test becomes available, he would want to get it. If I have some disease, even though I couldn't be cured, I would certainly want to know about it. John, it feels like across the board, researchers are calling this one a game changer. Right. So why? Well, it's so important, Vanita, because right now there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's at all. And the thinking now has become that the changes inside of the head, in the brain itself, begin 10, 20, maybe 30 years before the actual symptoms start. And that maybe the drugs that we're giving now are just too little, too late. If we give them earlier, before symptoms start, they may be effective. The other thing is we've never had anything to follow and figure out whether the drugs we're giving are effective. So if there were a simple blood test, that would be an amazing way to follow. Is this medication actually working? So what are the next steps to get getting this into wide use? Well, it's not a perfect test yet, and specifically, two of 20 normal patients tested positive. Those are called false positives, and obviously you don't want to have that. I spoke to Dr. Fedorov, and they're doing other refinements, adding maybe genetic material in with the lipid panel. And so I think over time, the test is going to get better. They're going to be have to be duplicated in other labs. And uh, with time, I think time is on their side, and I think this should be a very, very helpful test. hope so. Also this week, a report in the journal Pediatrics raises troubling questions about the effects on kids when parents are distracted by their cell phones. Holly, tell us about this study. Well, other than leaving me racked with guilt, Anthony, <laughs> I'll describe it. Uh, so, so researchers looked at 55 groups of, of people who were having a meal at a restaurant. The, the groups had parents or caregivers and kids. Uh, not surprisingly, 40 of those groups, and 40 of those groups, adults were actually on their mobile devices. And kids responded in one of two ways. Some of them withdrew and kind of tried to just amuse themselves quietly. Others really acted out in sort of escalating bids of bad behavior to try and get the grown-ups' attention. What I found really striking, though, was that the adults were much more likely to respond harshly, yell or scold the kids if they were trying to focus on their devices. But we obviously now know the short term. Short term, they're responding badly. The kids are responding badly. What about the long term, though? You know, the researchers are most concerned about just two things in particular. Number one, language and vocabulary. All of those abilities for kids are directly related to how much conversation they're having with their grown-ups. So if we're not engaging them, if we're not having that conversation, it can actually really affect their brain development. The other is just all emotional. Kids do get their feelings hurt when their grown-ups aren't paying attention to them. Um, so it's one more reason to, number one, I'm going to try not to feel guilty. I'm going to actually try and keep the phone in my I'm bag guilty. or something. <laughs> well, on Tuesday, the Food and Drug Administration approved a battery-operated headband as the first medical device to prevent migraine headaches. The ban puts out a low electrical current to stimulate nerves in the brain that are associated with migraine pain. It's designed for use by people 18 and older for no more than 20 minutes a day. Agency officials said the device could provide a new option for patients who can't tolerate migraine medications. 
Even as much of the nation was gripped by bitter winter weather this week, the spring allergy season is starting. An estimated 50 million Americans suffer from seasonal allergies with symptoms like sneezing, itchy eyes, and runny noses. So, John, um, with the winter weather hanging on so long, particularly, how do you tell the difference between allergies and a cold? It can be very tough, Anthony, because a lot of the symptoms are the same. You have the scratchy, sore throat, you have the stuffed nose. W one set of symptoms, itchy eyes, runny eyes, those tend to be more with allergies. But the other thing, as my mother would have said, use your head. You know, a cold is one or two weeks long. If, you're, if it's lasting weeks and then months and it comes on with the change of seasons, it's probably more allergies. And, and then there, there are different things you can do, obviously, for allergies. So what are those things, Holly? Well, you know, there's over-the-counter and prescription medicines that really, you know, are great effective treatments. But the focus on prevention is really about keeping allergens outside of your home. So number one, you should limit your time outdoors if you do have seasonal allergies. But when you come into your house, it's really important to take off your clothes, which may have pollen on them, and even take a shower to get the pollen out of your hair so that it doesn't then infect your, own, your, your home and sort of trigger those allergies throughout the day. Finally this week, researchers at Columbia University Medical Center have found that waiting just a fraction of a second before you make a decision can help you filter out distractions and avoid mistakes. John, what do you think of this report? I love this report. I think it's elegant, really well done. And we all live in this world, this multitasking world, where we all delusionally think we're good at doing a lot of things at once. <laughs> and what this is Delusionally saying, is the operative word <laughs> yeah, there. It's true. And, and this is saying, if you just take a beat, by the way, it was 120 milliseconds, one-tenth of a second, that your ability to filter out irrelevant stimulus improves and you make better decisions. I love this. Absolutely. And it was definitely anybody who, holding a weapon needs to take that, that extra millisecond. Well, it has actually, I talked to one of the authors last night and about exactly that with, with policemen, maybe that'll actually be used to help somehow figure out, you take that extra beat, because think about making that split second yeah. decision if you, if you shoot when you shouldn't, but on the other hand, if you wait too long, too long it's right, too exactly. long. So they're actually doing some more experiments now to say, well, how do we use this information to change behavior? Fortunately, okay. it helps us, those of us who are not even in that situation, which yeah. is particularly acute. Dr. John LaBouc, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both.